Let's go to our, oh, here, let me give you this first. And as I didn't pass out last week. So you can turn in your Bibles to John 1.1. 1, 1. We're going to look at uh, the false doctrine of the Jehovah's Witnesses tonight. See what the Bible has to say. And I think most of you know it. But let me read this. This they are they are very big on making a point when they go door to door. And uh, as we heard last week, I don't know if you were here last week, but uh, Bernie says you don't see them going door to door now, probably because of COVID. Uh, but as they went door to door, they made a they, they always make a, a big a point of saying we study the Bible, okay? And and that is a is a <laughs> it sounds like a good thing. Okay, let me read something I got in the mail. Actually, my dad got in the mail, but he wasn't going to open it up. Um, it's from, I, I, it was just a, an envelope with a, somebody handwritten letter, and I think they're doing this instead of going door to door. Okay, uh, it says, Dear Neighbor, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but uh, uh, they're talking about... Uh, having an annual convention presented by Jehovah's Witnesses titled Pursue Peace. There will be Bible-based talks. And you can you go online to, to do this. And uh, th But this is what they say. One couple of lines I wanted to read. So please log on to jw.org, a Bible-based website that is free. The Pursue Peace convention will help you find inner peace and peace with all. And uh, they, they, they know that as they go out, there are a lot of people out there who are not at peace. And so if they're searching for peace, then uh, it's going to be easy for them to fall into the trap of what, when somebody says you can find peace. And uh, they'll do that. I'm, I'm taking you to John 1.1 1, 1, just because this is probably the, the biggest, the, the place people usually go, I'd say, to, um, to show what the Jehovah's Witness, what they do about Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at several things tonight. It says in our Bible, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, how many of you know what the Jehovah's Witnesses have done with that verse? Just raise your hand if you know what they did to it. Okay, so now, now we have several people raise their hands. Who wants to share that with us? Tell us what they did. Okay, all right. Uh, Carol. Uh, you had said that they added the word on. Right. Uh, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. A God. Well, that, and when you look at what they, what they say on their website, I don't have any books to, to look at. I just look on the website, their website mostly, to see what they believe, what they say. Uh, they'll say it, it means he was, it says in their Bible, he was a God. But they mean, that means a divine being. They fall short or they hold back from saying Jesus Christ is a God because Jehovah is the only God and they, and they say that. There is only one God. But they deny the Trinity. But what they say about Jesus Christ is that He is a created being. Now on your paper there, uh, I don't think I have these statements, but um, this statement is there. Jesus is not a created being, unlike what they teach. Uh, Jesus, they say, um, was created, was the first creation of God. Let me read, read a quote right from their website, okay? Unlike any other human, Jesus lived in heaven as a spirit person 
before he was born on earth. Sounds like Mormons, but that's Mormons have everybody was a spirit person. We haven't gone to Mormons yet, have we? Okay, and then it says, He was God's first creation, and He helped in the creation of all other things. He is the only one created directly by Jehovah, and is therefore appropriately called God's only begotten Son. And then it says, makes this statement, Jesus served as God's spokesman, so he is also called the Word. I don't know what they say about Adam, but because, now Jesus, who, who does our Bible say created Adam? God, okay. God created Adam from the dust of the earth. And they say Jesus was God's first creation. They go on and say that Jesus helped create. So apparently Jesus helped create Adam. That makes to them, Adam was not the first creation. Jesus was. The Bible does not teach that Jesus was created. Jesus lived forever. Go over to Micah, the book of Micah. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. And we usually read this <laughs> most of the time is just uh, at Christmas time. It says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. It will not, just, not that he is just old, but his goings forth, what he has been doing, as always he has been. Everlasting, from everlasting. That means eternity past. He's talking about Jesus who was born in Bethlehem in Judea. Remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees? And he got in trouble for it. They started to kill him because he said, before Abraham was, then what? I am. And I've, I've mentioned this. It's, it's, I don't think it's just because he used the words I am because uh, that in Greek it's ego a me. And if you look at other places, Paul used the same words. He, said, he would say I am. But they'll say I am something or something like that. But he uses the terminology. So Jesus said before Abraham was, when he says I am, he's saying I am existing. He didn't say before Abraham was, I began. He didn't say before Abraham was, uh, I existed. No, he says before Abraham was, I am. And so what does that tell you? What does that tell me anyway? And he's existing and, and he's not subject to time. Physically, yes, Jesus was subject to all the things physically that human beings were, were limited to. So he was in time. But... The Christ has always existed. So Jesus is not a created being. They say that Jesus is actually Michael the Archangel. And uh, uh, let, I'm going to take you to a place, places in the scripture, what they say. But uh, keep in mind, we know that angels were created. Right? This is what they say. Michael is, quote, the archangel. The title archangel, meaning chief of the angels, appears in only two Bible verses. In both cases, the word is singular, suggesting that only one angel bears that title. One of those verses states that the resurrected Lord Jesus will descend from heaven with a commanding call with an archangel's voice. Go over to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, when, when they look at the Bible when they, and they try to prove things from the Scripture, what kind of... Uh, <laughs> I forgot what, what you'd call it. So when we go to the Bible, it's either eisegesis or 
exegesis. And we know that we're supposed to exegete something. What does it mean to exegete? Anybody? Carol? Out of the verses, not right. You go to the scripture and say, what does it say? What does it mean? What do I get from it? Right? Well, they're going to the scripture and they're getting from it what they have already put into it. Okay. Now look at what look at what this says in verse number 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So he comes, he says and now the first part um, where it says he shall descend from heaven with a shout. It looks and it sounds like that Jesus is going to shout. Uh, does that does that look like that to everybody? I don't know. Maybe it doesn't to a lot, a lot of people. Um, and then he then it says, with the voice of the archangel. But then it says, with the trump of God. So if if he's coming and he's going to shout, and since he's the archangel, he's coming with the voice of the archangel. Well, is he also the trump of God? No. So the archangel doesn't mean it's, it's just the leader of the angels. The, the part, the arch, the arc of the archangel means uh, the highest level. So an archangel is an angel. And Jesus Christ, uh, we know, is not an angel. They say he's not an angel. They say he's a god, right? Um, in uh, Jude, I think it's in Jude. I don't. I didn't write down the reference, but uh, remember where? No, it is Jude one nine. Look at look at one, Jude nine. Jude verse nine. Now, the the uh, Jude is telling us about um, people are, who are uh, false teachers and, and false leaders who are uh, not afraid to stand up against higher leaders. Then he, but he says this in verse nine. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Now, do you think Jesus would have to say, the Lord rebuke thee? No, if he's going to tell the Satan that he is wrong, if, if Jesus was the, the archangel, he wouldn't have to say, God rebuke you. He says, I rebuke you. Because Jesus is God. Jesus is not uh, a created being. Jesus also, number three on your on your sheet there, Jesus was not, this is what they believe, Jesus was not resurrected bodily, but as a spirit being. This one, this one has always got me. I, I never, never, I can't, I can't understand how they can miss what the Bible clearly teaches. But listen to what they say. After Jesus died, God restored him to life as a spirit person. Jesus then waited at God's right hand until Jehovah gave him power to rule as king over all the earth. Now Jesus is ruling as king in heaven and his followers are announcing that good news worldwide. Then they ask this question, in what form does Christ return? He was resurrected as an invisible spirit person. Then he went to heaven and sat at God's right hand. Uh, so Jesus returns not as a human, but as an invisible king. So they're saying Jesus was resurrected as a spirit. Now, the Bible teaches, and I'm, I'm sure their Bible teaches it, that the tomb was empty. <laughs> right? Maybe if anybody's studied the Jehovah's Witnesses, have you ever heard 
according to them, what happened to the body of Jesus? Anybody? I don't. I don't know what they think. The bo- what happened to the body? If the tomb was empty, and only Jesus' spirit came out, then where's the body? It must have just disintegrated in three days or something. But they say he's not. He was. A, he was a spirit being. Go over to Luke 24. And this is what I'm saying. I, I don't understand how they can. They have to explain it in some way because of what they believe. They can't just look at it and say, this is what I get from it. They believe he was resurrected as a spirit. So they have to explain this in some way, and I, and I don't know what they say about it. Look what it says uh, when Jesus appeared to the uh, disciples on the day that he rose from the dead. John, uh, Luke 24, and look at verse number 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Well, that's good for the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? They like peace. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they would say, well, they were right. Because they saw a spirit, right? But that's not what Jesus says. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me, and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. What does that sound like to you? Was he physical or spirit? Physical. You see me having bones and flesh. And so don't think I'm a spirit. Jehovah's Witnesses just bypass that or, or change it in some way. But uh, Jesus was resurrected with a glorified body. Uh, look at number four. Now, Jesus, what they say, is that Jesus returned invisibly in 1914. And that's what I read a little bit earlier where it says uh, Jesus returns not as a human but as an invisible king. There are so many different there were prophecies. They actually thought that Jesus was going to return in 1874. And that didn't happen. Then it went to 1878. Finally in 1914 they thought the uh, the way the Charles Russell, the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, what he taught was that there was going to be a big war in 1914, and uh, the end of the world was going to come, and Christ was going to return. Boy, they got their hopes up because in 1914 World War One started, and they thought that was that this was it. But no, the kingdoms of the world remained, and uh, so they had to try to figure out some other explanation of 1914 because they make their calculations and things like the like the uh, Seventh-day Adventists did. Um, I said, uh, let me uh, correct something. I, I looked and looked and looked to find out, and I said this last week, that they believe that Jesus came invisibly in 1914 to Brooklyn, New York. That's what I was taught in the past. I couldn't find anything like that on their website, so I don't know that I was taught right. So erase that from your mind. He did not return to Brooklyn, New York. That's where they had their headquarters for a long time, but they finally sold the property and made a bunch of money and moved. But uh, uh, that was just a lot later than 1914. Um, So they, they say that he returned invisibly to the heavens. Have you noticed that uh, of these um, these doctrines that whether it's Mormon or Seventh Day Adventist or Jehovah's Witness, they have these doctrines that say, uh, well, it was it, it's happening over there, it's happening here, and you can't prove it, you can't go there to see it. The Mormons say that uh, uh, there are spirit children in heaven, and you used to be a spirit child. 
there's no way to prove that except from what they, their uh, leaders have written. And the, the Seventh-day Adventists say that Jesus is in the heavenly sanctuary doing an investigative judgment. How do you prove that? You can't prove them wrong. It's almost like what you, you've heard, you've probably heard of uh, the, uh, oh boy, my, my words getting mixed up. Um, boy, it's not a proof. I, something about silence when you try to say, I'm going to prove something, and I, and I say, see, that doesn't say that there. And, and you're trying to prove something because it's not somewhere. And so when they have these, these doctrines, these false doctrines, you cannot see what they're saying. And they're saying, this is really what's happening because we know. No. You can't prove them wrong in that way. Um, so 1914, he did not return uh, in 1914. He's still coming back. Look at Matthew 24. So even if they say He came uh, invisibly in the heavens, there's nothing in Scripture that says He has already come back anywhere. Actually, if you want to get down to it, He never left spiritually, right? He says, where two or three are gathered together in My name, there I am in the midst. Is his body in the midst? No. So it must be his spirit is in the midst. He is there. And so, uh, no. invisibly, he is here. We can't see him. Look at verse number 30. Now, well, this is talking about when he returns, okay? Not uh, not at the rapture. At the rapture, he's, he's coming into the clouds, and we'll go up to be with him. This is talking about when he comes back to earth. Verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So they're going to see Him. When He returns, everybody's going to know it. Everybody on the earth is going to know He is coming. And He has come. And so He doesn't come invisibly. Number five, uh, they teach that while on earth Jesus was only a man. Um, not the Word made flesh. No, He, was, he, he is God in the flesh. Emmanuel, we know that. Uh, look, at, uh, look at John 1.14. Back in verses uh, uh, verses one through three, it's talking about Jesus being the Word of God because verse fourteen, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Now they can they can leave that verse alone the way it stands because they say He was God's spokesman and He's called the Word. And if, if in their Bible you go back to verse number one, he was a God. So the Word was Christ, and he became flesh. But he's not God coming in the flesh. That's what they, pre they preach. He is the Word made flesh, but he was not God. He was, though, God in the flesh. Uh, go over to John chapter 20. There are a lot, you know, I, I don't like to, to <laughs> look at all these uh, religions and, and uh, I started reading the Book of Mormon one time and uh, this is when I was in high school. I finally got to thinking, listen, why am I reading the Book of Mormon to find out what's wrong? Why don't I read the Bible to find out what's right? Spend my time in the truth and not, uh, not in false doctrine. So I don't like to try to find out everything about Jehovah's Witnesses. So I don't know what they say about this. But look what, what when Jesus, um, again, he, he, he had come to the disciples and showed them his hands and, and 
inside and said, I am I'm, uh, flesh and bone. Thomas wasn't there the first time. So then he, he appears to Thomas. And this is what we see. Verse number 28. Thomas sees him. And Jesus says, Behold, reach, reach your uh, hand and put it into my side and put your finger in my hand. Verse 28. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and what? My God. Then what does Jesus do? Does he say, Oh, don't call me God. Why are you calling me God? I'm not God. Doesn't say anything. He just goes on and talks to him. Uh, you, you, you've seen me and you believe. If Jesus was, you know, let me say it to, from the Jehovah's Witness perspective in a sense, if Jesus is as great as they make him out to be, he's actually better than they make him out to be. But if he's as great as they say he is, he should have told, he should have rebuked Thomas for calling him God. And he, he doesn't. Why? Why doesn't Jesus tell him to stop that? Say it loud, out loud, Elaine. I saw your... What's that? He is God. So he's not going to tell him no. So it wasn't just a man. It God with us, God in the flesh. I want to do one more, number six, and then we'll uh, close for tonight. They say the Holy Spirit is not... They, they don't believe in the Trinity, okay? They don't believe that God is uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all in one, okay? Uh, it, is, it is something that is, is uh, I believe, un understandable to the human mind. We can't prove it because we are in finite world. We can't even understand it completely. But they reject it totally. And so they, they say God is the Father, Jesus is the Son, and the Holy Spirit is the force or the power of God. This is what they say, the Holy Spirit is God's power in action, His active force. God sends out His Spirit by projecting His energy to any place to accomplish His will. Well, that, there's, in a sense that's true, but, gee, but the Holy Spirit is a person. The third person of the Trinity. How do we know that the Holy Spirit is a person and not, a, not an active force? What is, what is energy anyway? How does energy work on its own? Can you guys see electricity? I say you guys. Can anybody see electricity? But there's power there, isn't it? It's called electromotive force. The, the power is pushing the electricity to do something. And so they're saying that, that Jesus is, or the Holy Spirit is like that. He pushes the Holy Spirit, the, His power, someplace to do some work. Um, look over and look at a, a few, a couple of places. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 30. It says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. How many of you have ever grieved electricity? Did you ever make electricity feel bad? Hurt inside? That's what they're saying. They're saying if, if, if the Holy Spirit is just the active force of God, how in the world can you grieve His active force? You can grieve God right? You can grieve the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is God. Go over to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5 and look at verses 3 and 4. 
Now this is where Ananias and Sapphira agreed on lying about how much money they made off the sale of their property. Verse 3, But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back, keep back part of the price of the land? Okay, how many of you have lied to electricity? Or how many of you have lied to the wind? Now, can you lie to something that is just a force? A chair doesn't even have a force. Can you lie to the chair? Wouldn't make any sense to try, would it? So he lied to the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, right? Now, look at verse 4. Whiles it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. He lied to the Holy Spirit. He lied to God. And that's that. Again, that sure sounds clear to me. So the, they teach that he is not a part of the Trinity, not a person, but only an active force. We will go on to verse number seven, or number seven next week. Um, so keep keep hold of your page and uh, bring it back next week. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word that we can understand and look at it, read it, and know you, and know what you want for us, and know who you are, who Jesus is, the Holy Spirit, all the things about you that we understand through what you've told us. Lord, it's sad that people believe something different, and it keeps them from knowing the truth. They think they have the truth, but they've changed it, changed your word to what they believe. Lord, help us to not only avoid listening to the false doctrine, but know how to correct it and teach the truth to those who are thinking and believing wrong. Lord, guide us now tonight as we go to prayer. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.